You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Joining John today are Drs. Gary Nolan and Peter Scafish. Dr. Peter Scafish is a sociocultural anthropologist who works between his discipline and philosophy on how ideas, cosmologies, and translation shape the diversity of human thought and experience. He is currently engaged in research that employs anthropological perspectives on pluralism, cosmology, modernity, and religion to anticipate how the sort of non-human beings that we imagine to design UAP might think, and in what ways this thinking is likely to be both commensurate and incommensurate with our own. He is also developing his advisory research for Sol broad recommendations for genuinely democratic, whole-of-society approach to solving the legal, political, and environmental problems raised by UAP. He has a PhD in anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, and has held faculty and research positions in the United States, France, Canada, and Germany, including at universities such as UC Berkeley, the Collège de France, McGill University, and the Bauhaus University, Weimar. Dr. Nolan is the Ratchford and Carlota A. Harris Professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He has published over 300 research articles and is a holder of 40 U.S. patents and has been honored as one of the top 25 inventors at Stanford University. His area of research includes hematopoiesis, cancer and leukemia, autoimmunity and inflammation, and computational approaches for network and systems immunology. Dr. Nolan's efforts are to enable a deeper understanding not only of normal immune function, trauma, pathogen infection, and other inflammatory events. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Doctors Peter Scafish and Gary Nolan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, my first question I want to direct to uh, Gary because we were talking about it off air. Scientists looking into the UAP phenomenon and people still sometimes scoff at it, even though we have this mountain of governmental evidence that there is something going on here. There's a something here. What is your view and how have you navigated the sort of landscape of ridicule? Well, I think you start, as with any scientific idea, when it's first brought up and people might look askance at it. And so what, what do you do? You say to the, I wouldn't even call them opposing party, I would say you say to the discussants at the table, what's the data? What is it that we have in front of us that tells us that there's actually something worth looking at? And I, I take a step back and say, how is it that a scientist approaches a, pr a problem in general? You look for something called preliminary data where there's enough evidence to suggest that there's something there worth looking for. You don't jump to a conclusion. You say that here are the possible conclusions that might be on the table because of the data. You don't start by taking things off the table. If the data says, well, the question is open enough that it's worth raising the following 10 questions. Now, scientists like humans are herd animals. And so much of the skepticism that I think you have out there in the world is because people are just following the herd. But like any good herd animal, somebody has to sense, let's call it the predator. And in this case, the predator is an idea that there might actually be something else out there that is outside of our normal range of considerations. And let's just say it right up, UAP, whatever these phenomena are. So somebody says, let's follow this up and get interested in it. Now, if you have the rest of the herd saying don't follow the idea, then you're at risk of the predator doing something to you. Now, if you though can convince enough people that here's a credible way to talk about it, in this case, we're talking about, and let's get right to the science of it, there's a credible way to talk about what if without coming to conclusions, you start to get more and more individuals involved, then that adds to the impetus that more people should pay attention. And I've had no problem over the last two or three years, especially with other scientists being interested in it and having very detailed discussions and hundreds now of scientists wanting to get involved. 
because they've now started to see the data and agree with me that there's something here worth following. Peter, your view from the point of anthropology. Well, yeah, I think, how could I follow up on that? I think what Gary said about the, the herd mentality here is uh, with skepticism is, is quite insightful. What I would add to that is that, you know, the last 400 years of history from 17th century forward, which is how people like me and anthropology related fields define modernity, the, the cultural epoch we live in that comes with a, a certain anthropocentric cosmology, that period of time has been defined by skepticism because a, a certain level of skepticism was necessary to get the natural sciences as we know them today off the ground and running. And, and we owe a certain skeptical spirit to the, the philosopher René Descartes, who in a way embodied for us the idea that a truly insightful mind was going to be perceived primarily with skepticism. In the last four or five decades, social scientists and humanities scholars have called into question the usefulness of that level of skepticism. And we've certainly, we've had precursors in philosophy doing that, like the philosopher William James, who is interested in a variety of anomalous experience from religious experience to psychical phenomena to psychopathology. And the attitude we've taken is that skepticism erodes social trust. We don't trust each other and we don't trust what people think. We don't trust what people say. We even don't trust people's interests when they're engaged in intellectual and other kinds of inquiry, because we assume in advance that not only that they must be wrong, but that there are kind of liabilities for us if we take on board some of their ideas and let them influence us. So I, I'd say there's a kind of psychological and social dimension of skepticism, just as Gary is, in which we become kind of phobic towards the other who thinks things that we're afraid of. And a lot of, I, I think a lot of scientists like Gary, and Gary has kind of phenomenal curiosity across domains, recognize that this isn't healthy. And and one thing I would say about this is, is we know from this philosopher I mentioned, William James, that often belief in a possibility makes for better science, better philosophical inquiry, better social science, because your belief that something might be the case actually motivates you to confirm it. Whereas people with low belief in a possibility tend not to be motivated to take the risk, the financial risk, the existential risk, the social risk, to actually do very serious science and very serious inquiry. I, and Peter's perfectly right on that. It made me think of something that I really hadn't before on you know this whole skepticism and how it drove the literally the creation of science. I mean, you know, before we had the kind of science that we think of as today, we had 100,000 theories about how the universe operated. Uh, ev everything from religious to shamanistic to mysticism, et cetera. And the idea of using skepticism and proof came along and said, let's just order the world according to a certain set of rules, or at least here's how we will discover what those rules are and what their validity is. But like everything, there's a pendulum. And as Peter, I think, is pointing out, the pendulum, at least in, in some instances in modern society, has moved too far to the overt antagonism to how new ideas might contribute. I mean, I never achieved anything in my laboratory or in the various companies and things that I have created by following the grain. It's always been people fought me at the beginning, and now everybody uses the technology that we invented. So, you know, I, I, I think that, and, and if you look at inventors and entrepreneurs and creators in either business or science or philosophy, it's always been ideas that went against the grain. And, and yet they were the things that ended up changing the world. Now, one thing here though, and it has to be noted is that, look, there's not that much of a reason to be hyper skeptical anymore. <laughs> we have a bunch of government action and problems that are becoming apparent within government that are showing that there is something here and there's a something here. And that's the thing is that it's not really that level of skepticism is not warranted by anything any longer, I don't think. What do you think? No, it's it's really not warranted by that. And I, I said in an interview recently for The Hill, and I'll, I'll say it again, people should be extremely high confidence that there are genuine UAP vehicles, by which I mean these are, these are not vehicles 
made by human beings. We can call them non-anthropogenic, and they should have that high level of confidence because we now have eight distinct pieces of legislation passed by Congress, not stuff that's in draft, eight pieces of legislation, always sections generally of the, the annual defense legislation um, that aren't just, they don't just concern the vehicle, they concern Congress's interest in getting the bottom of what pockets of the intelligence community, Department of Defense, probably the Department of Energy, and also certain defense contractors know about these vehicles, what they know by detection and tracking, which is in the legislation, what they know from uh, recovery of the vehicles following landings or crashes, and also from the study of the vehicles once they've gotten their hands on them. And there's a lot of public discussion about that legislation that really comes at it from the wrong angle. You know, there's a, a kind of Reddit thread of discussion that suggests the legislation might be some kind of psychological or information operation against the American people, which, which is a pretty absurd possibility to entertain because you would have to think that, that Chuck Schumer, Kirsten Gillibrand, Marco Rubio were willing to sponsor basically fraudulent legislation that would put them in jeopardy with their constituencies. I suppose to kind of signal to uh, to the public or to China that certain technologies that belong to the U.S. were somehow alien. That's very, very implausible. That legislation emanates from the committees in Congress that have access to the most sensitive classified information. And the staff members and the congressional members of those committees, they know how to vet classified information. They know how to assess whether they're being spun. They know how to dialogue with people briefing them to make sure that they're really getting the kind of information they need. And that legislation is based on, on that kind of briefing, based on that kind of classified information. And I don't think anyone should have any doubt about the fact that good decisions were made within the Senate and also within the House to go ahead and start to have the legislative branch participate in decisions and activities taking place in other parts of federal government about UAP. Do you gentlemen think that we had the Schumer Amendment, but then there was a gutting of it and it sort of lost some of its teeth, though it, it had some pretty strong teeth initially. Do you think that affects it? Do you think it can still be effective once enacted, it, it could still be effective as far as enlightening us on what's going on here. I think the way that the new act is structured does put things behind the scenes again. But let's go back for your audience a little bit and list some of the things that were actually in that UAP amendment that Schumer and Rounds put forward, just so they understand the context of what was in it and what was lost. But lost doesn't mean forever. Let's just keep it at that. So the first was, it was an all of government collection of the data and bringing it under the purview of a group of professionals that would include intelligence community, individuals, military, public individuals, lay people, sociologists, ethicists, scientists, et cetera, who would look at the totality of it. They would of course have the necessary clearances to do so and would decide, okay, well, for good reason, this needs to stay secret, but for also good reason, this can now go into the public domain. And then there was a third arm that I had put forward, which was, well, it might be something that's not so secret, but might have material utility in the sciences, and perhaps there's an opportunity for public-private investment to bring other scientists in. Okay, so this circles back to what Peter just said. Why would the U.S. government, Congress, like 10 or 12 senators, a whole retinue of Congress people, put something like this together and allow it to go forward. Okay, so it went forward, it went to committee, and then a couple of representatives, Republicans both, came out of the woodwork, had not been involved previously in any of the discussions in the write-up of it, and put enormous pressure. And as interestingly, as well did some aeronautics companies, a lobbying group, come forward and put enormous pressure to have certain of the provisions removed. Well, what were those provisions? Well, one of them was the UAP committee to be, you know, oversight committee to be appointed by Biden and confirmed by the Senate. The other was to remove what was called the eminent domain provision, which would have given the government the right 
to seize materials being held allegedly by some of these contractors. So why would two Republican, one was the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, sorry, the uh, Congressional Senate, and the other was Armed Services. House Intelligence Committee. House Intelligence, sorry, thank you. Why would they spend so much time and effort to gut something that didn't exist in the first place? So I asked critics who you mentioned in the run-up before we were to the program who had skepticism in saying, well, you're going to ruin the reputation of your program. I challenged them, first of all, to reach out to me and talk to me and see if I think my reputation has been ruined or I would ruin anybody's reputation, myself or Stanford as well. But I challenged them to go in and look at that and be ready for me to challenge their knowledge of the subject. And if they don't have any knowledge of the subject, I would demand a retraction. That's a common theme. You know, you, you find that usually more often than not, they haven't gone down the rabbit hole. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you don't have to be, look, I'm skeptical of a lot of the things that I hear. Absolutely. And I hold it all in abeyance. I hold all of it in, you know, in a quantum irreality. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the deciding data factoid to let it all to collapse into some set of truths. But the best scientists, the best thinkers are able to do that, to keep all things juggled until the moment of truth that allows you to put the whole thing together. Yeah, that's quite well said, Gary. And, and to kind of follow up, I mean, to bring it back to some of the scientific questions, as, as we discuss these political ones, is, uh, you know, there, there's a misperception among people, not only skeptics, but people are confused about this, about academics like us, government people like us who are engaged with the subject, and really devoting a lot of uh, daily hours to it professionally, that we believe we understand a lot about this. You know, Gary's known for a long time, and I've known for a couple of years now, a lot of the best people coming out of government on this and a lot of the best scientists who kind of run with them. And among this network, and I'll include myself in it now, we don't think we know much at all, it, it, right down to the question of whether these things are extraterrestrial or something else. All the, the, the thing people are most confident about is that there is technology there, there's a kind of vehicle there. But there's a lot of, it, the rest of it is, is many possibilities. And, and Gary put it pretty well. They stay in a kind of virtual state of superposition for us where we're entertaining all of them at once and committing to almost none of them. Even if we have an inkling that a, a few might be correct to the exclusion of others, once, once things come out of uh, superposition, so to speak. And, and that's, the, you know, discovering that uh, uh, as, as I've interacted with government people and scientists on this who have been working on this for years, actually gave me a lot of confidence that I, I was on the right track with this because I found that I was in very serious intellectual company, very serious scientific company, very serious thinking company, because I wasn't dealing with weak minds. I've, I've, I've met some of the strongest minds I, I've known in this field, very strong empiricists, very strong theoreticians, and truly curious minds, some of whom are, are absolutely formidable. But I think the old question is, what are the critics afraid of? I mean, really, it's w w why are you afraid to talk about it? And why do you care what I think? And why do you care that I think the way I do? Right? What, what is it? What they need to look, they need to pick up a mirror and look at it and say, why does it bother you? To, to even entertain the possibility. And if you're not willing to look into the raw data, then step aside and let somebody else do it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I agree. And personally, I like entertaining the, the possibilities. That's where, that's where anything interesting in life happens, is when you entertain alternate possibilities that challenge your own beliefs, and then you get to know what your beliefs actually are. And that, to me, has been the most useful exercise in the whole UAP phenomenon following it for years now, is that it does challenge my scientific thinking, but at the same time, I can't tell you why. So <laughs> there just doesn't seem to be any reason, especially when you have a bipartisan effort like this in Congress. And that's a very important word, bipartisan with the exception of the two opposing senators that opposed the Schumer Amendment for whatever reason. But everybody seemed to be on the same page. You can find, you know, Moskowitz or plenty of Republicans, Burchett. So half of the government seems to agree, but there does seem to be some contingent within it 
that doesn't agree and doesn't want this out there. So my question for you, Peter, is this. What do we do? How do we get the government to take a look internally at itself and try to weed out what the problem is here? Well, okay, my, my current view on this, and this is something I'm really devoting time to in 2024, both in terms of advocacy and, and writing, is I think it falls to Congress right now to, to make that happen. And that's first and foremost, because the, the, any activity that exists within government historically on this has been within the executive branch. And without pointing the finger or condemning, we can start simply by saying branches of government tend not to reform themselves. It, that this is what checks and balances are about in the American system. And, you know, there are times the executive branch has to, to push the legislative on certain things. In this case, the legislative really has to push the executive on this because with the Schumer Amendment, in a way, they just gave the executive the opportunity to drive and, and control the, the review process. The, the, the panel, the Schumer Amendment, um, the declassification review panel, the Schumer Amendment was, was to create was to operate on behalf of the president and report to some extent to Congress. Without that there, I think Congress made a fairly diplomatic implied gesture on that point, and we're trying to work very constructively with, with the administration. I think now the, the ball goes back to Congress, and Congress has to make its own decisions about how it's going to do this without real assistance from the executive outside all domain anomaly resolution office, which hasn't been useful. So they're going to have to make that decision and they're probably going to have to resort. And, and this is, you know, the, the talk of house right now, the house oversight committee, they're going to have to resort to some kind of investigation to conduct such an investigation. They're going to need partners in the executive branch for sure, but they're also going to have to proceed with the attitude that they're going to have to push. They're going to have to show they mean it and, they're going to have to say fundamentally, you know, we should have never been cut out of this uh, as a domain of knowledge and activity with, within the executive branch of the U.S. government. We had every right to uh, participate in decisions about this, to legislate about it, to have oversight uh, over it. And yet that never happened from the 1940s, 50s forward. Um, we've, we've only had a kind of you know, very minimal beginning of oversight in the last few years. And it's, it's fairly meaningless at this point, given the amount of activity that's probably there historically. And I think you saw something happen just in the last couple of days, to Peter's point, where members of the House had a meeting with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Communities, primarily about David Grish's claims. And all the main members who'd been at the original hearing were there. And then, perhaps surprisingly, two individuals who the two representatives who came out against the amendment, Turner and Rogers, they showed up as well at a meeting for something that wasn't supposed to exist. And that surprised everybody that they showed up. To a one of them, they came out very stone-faced, and several of them came up to the reporters who were on hand and basically said, there's something here and we need to follow up on this. And all of the things that Peter just said about representative government. But one of them especially struck me and he came out and he goes, what this told me was what everybody has feared, that the American people are being kept out of something and that there's a concerted effort to stop them from knowing about it. So, you know, the old adage, where there's smoke, there's fire. What is it that needs to be understood here? Oh, and the other main point that came across from all of them was, from what we heard, what David Grush said, and we heard this directly from the ICIG, he was credible. And I just read something recently, they said, and we know where the programs are. I was literally just on Twitter this morning. We now know where the programs are. So put that in the hopper, skeptics, and chew on it. And let's see what you have to say after that. <laughs> Peter, my question for you, again, is, is in, in the perspective of anthropology is, all right, so... We get the goods, and this has been a secret that's been held for 70 years, <laughs> and been their misdirection, and some people, you know, there are claims of very dark stuff, very dark stuff in the history of this subject, and that all comes out, 
and we find out that the CIA or somebody is misbehaving like they have in the past, <laughs> what happens to American society and global societies if this kind of information comes out that there's something happening that we don't really understand? Well, you know, first there's the problem for U.S. government and also social bonds in the United States at a time when there's very low trust in government. There's very low trust between different social groups and collectives in the United States. There's there's increasing skepticism, I say in quotations, directed against science of all things. And, you know, so this has to be dealt with very responsibly, very carefully, because, you know, as, as someone on Capitol Hill said to Gary and I once in person um, during a meeting we had there, in a way, this person said, we're, we're giving to the American people the ultimate uh, conspiracy theory, and yet it's true. And I think, you know, I've I've had activist friends say the amount of outrage there will be among people who aren't willing to be diplomatic about this is 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 going to be massive because this is such a significant fact, and the secrecy was so total, so blanket, and so successful that the feeling people are going to have uh, about being lied to about this, and, and it was a lie at different times. It was an explicit lie. It wasn't just misdirection. It's going to be terrible. So I think this has to be managed in a in a very cautious spirit and with a sense that it's it's not going to be good for anybody if there's too much accusation, if there's, there's too much blaming, and if there's too much of a desire uh, to see heads roll. You know, we don't want the guillotine for this. We don't even want too many uh, it, 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 indictments and prison sentences. I think we need to have a reckoning, a big social reckoning, but it needs to be done in a way that is much more about getting access to truth and uh, than it is about uh, trying to prosecute people. And I'm, and I'm not trying to say that Congress shouldn't have an interest in that or that law enforcement shouldn't have an interest in that, but I think the emphasis needs to just be about informing people and really going into, you know, discovering what the real reasons were at different points in U.S. history for beginning in the secrecy and maintaining the secrecy. I don't think that was all irresponsible, but I think that as the secrecy continued in its blanket fashion, certainly there was some irresponsibility because it went on for too long. It was too total. And it, it really, I, I think, has created a distorted sense of who, you know, we, 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 we barely can estimate the damage that it's done to ourselves uh, as human beings in our self-understanding to have had a secret kept in this way that might have you know, enlightened us, that would have enlightened us inevitably about who we are, what we are. And I won't even say what our place in the universe is, but what the universe is at all, because I think it will cause us to reframe our, our understanding of that and eventually to see a new, um, uh, a, a new scientific facts about what, what we call the universe today. And that's one of the things that brought Peter and I together to create the Soul Foundation, which was to basically put these things in context for government and for commercial entities, and to basically provide them the reasoning that Peter just went through from a historical or a sociological point of view, and to be there as an outside academic advisory group to provide information to government agencies about how to approach it, to write the white papers about what the context is, what's the history, what were the perhaps original reasons why this all came to be, and then what are the proofs. And to do it in a way, and this circles all the way back to the whole idea of skepticism and scientific proof and discussion, is and to provide the paper trail in the public record, in the public realm, that allows other scientists to approach it and say, okay, well, here's a non tinfoil hat approach to this that reasons all of this out in a parlance and a language that I understand. And Peter has a parlance and an audience in his academic realm that's different than mine, which is why having these two kinds of disciplines together in one organization, the Saul Foundation, really matters. It is of the utmost importance to have cross-disciplinary talk. Talk to the astrophysicists, talk to, which I know you do, and get everybody involved. And from your background, Gary, with medical science, there are all kinds of things in material science that, that could be done 
that puts everybody's heads together. Let me ask you this though, gentlemen, would the next step, would it be helpful if Congress had subpoena power, teeth, and a general amnesty to offer anybody in government a way out to just disclose it, at least internally to Congress? Well, the whistleblower law is already there. Do you want- Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I want to I want to take that because you you probably don't need subpoena power initially. There there are other ways to conduct an investigation in, in Congress that, that that you know it doesn't involve the prospect of prosecution. It, it's much more about securing cooperation with certain witnesses, uh, uh, people in certain agencies, and Congress saying, well, you know, look, we're being conciliatory, we're being diplomatic, but we want you to come in and tell us exactly what's going on and to do it in the you know to the right committees the right environments where they have access to classified information but but we also want you to say it in public in such a way that that people can understand in simple terms what's happened and what's true in an interview i did the other day one of the people interviewed me said you know i generally the public doesn't care about the arcana of classified programs and the details of budgets and which military base might be housing, which piece of technology and so on. They want to know basic facts like, you know, look, okay, are these vehicles real? What do you know about them? Is there some, you know, is there a biological dimension to um, whatever might be on board the vehicle? Is there not? Um, is, is there safety here or is there not? You know, very simple, basic questions that I think could be answered in an open environment. And I think that's what needs to happen. The Seoul Foundation and the recent conference, how did things go? And, and gentlemen, what was your takeaway as the founders? What was your takeaway from the uh, speakers? Well, personally, I, I learned a lot, especially in the non-science context, about how other frames of reference and academics can approach the problem and talk about it in different ways religion being one of them, especially. There was a military IC sort of government component to the conference as well. I mean, Carl Nell, the framer essentially of the UAP amendment was there and gave a, a rundown for the whys and wherefores of all of, of why certain things were put in and why they are important. And all of those videos, thankfully, will hopefully soon be up for everybody to, to view. And again, I'd ask our skeptical friends out there to take a look at them and see what they think. But I think the uniform feedback that, that we got, and I think Peter and I were both surprised because we were so in the middle of putting it all together, was how much people really enjoyed it and felt it was historic that they could actually have these kinds of conversations on the Stanford University campus and the engineering quad sponsored by Stanford and approved by Stanford because Stanford's all about the open inquiry. They've, they've never stopped me from doing anything. They actually encouraged me to do it. So I was thrilled with the feedback. I was exhausted afterwards, but I was thrilled. Peter, go ahead. Peter, your thoughts? Well, that, that I, I think our symposium, yeah, we, we got universally not just positive but enthusiastic feedback about that and and i think a lot of that came from professionals in a variety of fields and i mean a, a wide variety we had venture capitalists there we had people in the defense industry we had artists and creative writers um, we had um, uh, scientists of course we had uh, humanities people we had people from government. Um, I mean, we really had a wide gamut of people there. And and the enthusiasm they expressed about the event uh, really had to do with the fact that we, we created very professional discourse. And on top of that, we brought in people that in different ways are all doing very innovative work on this. I mean, Carl Nell took a very inventive approach to that legislation. I mean, it was in a, in a way, it was a perfect piece of legislation. And he was able to show how you know, he thought very systematically about what needed to take place if there was going to be responsible disclosure on the part of the United States government. We have we had other scientists there that have you know utterly unique approaches to UAP, which you know don't start from traditional UAP data. They start, uh, for instance, with um, uh, astronomical images which show transient objects which may very well be as we understand them 
so it was you know the quality of a professional discourse but also the fact that we we brought in really really inventive people on this and maintained a very high bar um, with with the people we we chose and also on the kind of discussion we had and i don't think that's been done in exactly that way there are groups that are doing it but uh, let's say without the same level of probably conviction and shared focus future conferences will there be more yes we're actually literally this morning peter and i uh, were in a group discussion about having more one large conference certainly again this year and perhaps some smaller summit conferences as well timing and nature of them still to be determined a powerful case for why anthropology should study outsiders of thought and their speculative ideas dr peter scafish's book Rough Metaphysics, the speculative thought and mediumship of Jane Roberts, is now offered to Event Horizon viewers with a 40% off discount code. Use the link in the description or in the pinned comment below and use the discount code MN91060, which is good all the way through to February 29, 2024. Catastrophic disclosure, where whatever is disclosed is dangerous in some way. What are your guys' view on this idea of catastrophic disclosure that's been floating around as of late? I'd like to answer that because I, I think that the fact that the Schumer Amendment was gutted, it actually, it, it, you know, the folks that you know were intent on doing that, I'm not talking about this, who were intent on doing that, about the big provisions, maybe not some small provisions like eminent domain clauses that were in there, but in, in fact, who really didn't want the review of classified records to take place and to result in some kind of uh, controlled public disclosure. I think they brought us to a situation where we're going to see uncontrolled and potentially catastrophic uh, disclosure, catastrophic in the etymological sense that it'll be a overturning order and it, it may happen very suddenly. I, I think that you know we with the disclosure we had in 2024 excuse me 2023 was to some extent uncontrolled disclosure it was it was done legally it was done through a process that would be considered responsible by people coming out of the military and intelligence community who have security clearances but it was not it, it was not directed by any government agency or by congress or the office of the president and i'm speaking of Dave Grush's uh, public testimony about his, his whistleblowing activity, that was disclosure. And part of Congress uh, got it quite right. Uh, they got it exactly right by understanding that, that this was not just a credible set of claims on his part, but they were accurate and they needed to pay attention precisely because there's a democratic, uh, democratic politics here at stake. And I, what I would say is that if the whistleblowers, future whistleblowers, should they come forward, are not supported, if Congress is not supported by the executive in its desire to create uh, transparency, openness, on this, and decrease the secrecy, you're going to see more of that. And you're going to see the version potentially that would be something like civil disobedience. Now, I'm not advocating for that publicly. We haven't seen an Edward Snowden figure on UAP, classified UAP data yet, should that person come along, that would be something like catastrophic disclosure because suddenly, if there was something like a document dump, if there was suddenly someone out in public who could attest to their credentials, who was able to provide verifiable information, things that are being kept secret in the UAP domain, every investigative journalist would suddenly realize it was accurate and it would be a complete scandal in the press. And the political fallout for, from that uh, would be quite extreme. It would force a statement from whoever the sitting president is. It would force a lot of scrambling uh, across executive branch agencies. There would be a lot of cleanup, just as there was um, uh, with um, Edward Snowden. Um, it would, would damage, let's say, I, I, I'm, not I'm, I'm not advocating for thinking only terms, but it would damage U.S. national security. These are serious um, equities the U.S. government has in these technologies, and they, by their own logic, they're right to keep them uh, secret and right to be very careful about what might be known about them. 
to the public. So that's a real possibility right now. And I think that those, you know, you know, people and groups within the executive and defense contractors who think you can just keep this bottled up are probably playing with fire right now. And the fire will affect federal government. Nobody needs that right now. So I think we have to encourage cooperation between the executive uh, uh, and the legislative and also the, the contractors and the legislative and try to bring them together into a productive dialogue in which it's possible to say, look, nobody wants crisis for the U.S. government where suddenly you've got uncontrolled leaking and the recognition by the press that it's real and you're forcing a president not only to have to speak to this, but I would say also to be then left holding the bag, which no administration wants to do with this, if you've had generations of secrecy. So I think it's a very real prospect. And I think it's something that, you know, everyone is concerned about this should be working constructively to prevent. And I would additionally say, and we can we could go into it if you want, the, the social consequences. I don't think most people have really reflected on that. You know, the, it sounds like a kind of Hollywood movie cliche, but markets could be affected. International relations could be affected. Um, even disclosure as it's happened so far, or government acknowledgments as, as they've happened so far, have likely been read by China as messages of some kind, even if they're not, or as indications that maybe the U.S. has had some kind of technological breakthrough, whether they, they've had it or not. Um, that's being concealed by trying to uh, misdirect adversaries by suggesting that um, U.S. Uh, experimental or uh, classified technology that's operational already is actually UAP vehicles. So, so the the social and international consequences are, are very, very serious, and people should take that seriously and not be hoping that this goes too fast. It would be a great situation if an administration. Congress could come to a constructive agreement about how to do this in a paced way um, that that wouldn't lead to a situation that they couldn't handle. Yeah, what, what Peter is calling out is the counterpoint to catastrophic disclosure. I mean, catastrophic disclosure doesn't mean the world is going to end. It means we don't understand all of the consequences of how the information might suddenly, if released, change markets, change social dynamics, society, politics, et cetera. The, the, the counterpoint to catastrophic is controlled. Controlled disclosure is really what the UAP amendment, and I think its follow-ons that will be put forward, were meant to cover, is to prepare the levers and mechanisms of society to what's coming. I mean, let's just put one example out on the table, even though it's almost perhaps the most far-fetched something like a, a, a way to change how we utilize gravity, right? Or a way to change how we utilize energy. Those could be catastrophic to the current infrastructure of how the planet operates, as opposed to controlled, which would be, let's let out a little piece of the technology that we can attempt to understand that might change our fundamental understanding of how materials operate. Look, for example, and I've used this example before of, how a grain of silicon or a grain of sand, germanium, changed all of human society. It created the computer chips and the artificial intelligence of today. Simple, tiny grain of sand and how you dope it with contaminants, as it was called at the time, right? And that understanding changed everything. So imagine that if these vehicles, I mean, for me, it's more than if, but I'll just keep it in the scientific realm. If these vehicles are operating with principles we don't understand. It's not magic. We just don't understand the physics right now. Plenty of stuff we don't understand about physics. What mo one minor understanding of the hundreds of technology revolutions that it took to get there could do to us. That's controlled use of the disclosure process as opposed to uncontrolled where everything is, nobody knows where anything's going and markets, and markets hate unpredictability. Trillions of dollars. Now I have been privy to data ostensibly, allegedly produced on the study of some of the materials. And if one of my graduate students came to me with that kind of data or report, I would put them up for review as to whether their PhD candidacy should go forward. And what I'm saying in that is that what's happening is 
that the kinds of science that need to be done are not being done. And it's not that people don't have the best intention to do it. It's just that they don't have the scientific method at heart, right? They don't, they, they collect the information, they put it in a report and nobody looks at it and says, well, was this done the right way? Is, or do we have the right controls? And almost more important, how can we use it? I mean, uh, that to me is, is sort of the whole reason that the public funds science is not to satisfy my personal curiosity. It's to say, okay, Gary, we're going to use your curiosity to get something done. But remember in the back of your head that that's always the reason why we're giving you the money. And that's the difference between, I think, the kind of data that I've seen versus the kind of data and how to use it and how it can be done. Still, though, if you could figure out anything regarding the materials or whatever, you know, of a of a recovered UAP, that's very valuable if you can figure it out. And do you think that the simple reason for all the secrecy and hyper classification is simply that we haven't figured it out and we know that if we do, it would be Amazing. Well, nobody can know. I mean, if, if I operated my lab the way that these SAPs, these special access programs work, I would get nothing done. I, my, my lab works in a very, let's like say, open network where everybody's project is slightly dependent on the knowledge that's created in another. And I never, cre- I never allow for anybody to be, I let leaders happen by how they use their data and how they share it. And that creates the kind of environment that pushes science forward in the best possible way. It incentivizes leaders to become leaders and it incentivizes people to follow the data because the data produces the papers that pushes their careers forward. And my students have spun out, I don't know, God knows how many companies uh, out of my lab because of that. That's benefited society. And that's what I want to see happen here. And that's what I think can happen, but I just don't think it's structured in the right way. Do you think it's a over compartmentalization problem in that they've compartmentalized it so much that nobody can look, <laughs> you know, nobody. Yeah. John, I would follow up on Gary, Gary's point on this by engaging a little bit of a kind of sociological speculation, on this, but I mean, kind of rigorous and insightful speculation, you know, our, our colleague and, and Gary's mentor, the, the French, um, uh, information scientist and ufologist, uh, Jacques Vallée, I made a very remarkable um, and, and I think insightful observation in uh, one of his classic books on the subject where he said, look, there is there is a government cover-up, um, but the, the cover-up has another dimension, which is that there we, we cover up the our, our, our encounter with the phenomena from ourselves. There's a kind of unconscious repression or a kind of collective psychological dissociation by which we um, we, we deny that there's something there um, and we deny to ourselves that we know something about it or we've experienced it. And if you look at the way, if you look at the allegations that come from Dave Brush or others, because he's not the first person who, who said that, we've had some other witnesses uh, who have been pretty public about this, I'm saying that we have very extreme compartmentalization it's activities or pseudo programs being hidden within programs um, and kept in private industry so that you minimize reporting requirements. If you look at that as what's taking place with something as profound as this, as something as exciting as this, and something as dangerous as this, and then you you try to uh, you know square it with the fact that you know you have to have agency directors in the intelligence community. Uh, secretaries of defense, um, very high military intelligence officials, um, all the way up to the National Security Council and probably historically presidents, um, uh, being cognizant of this stuff, then you realize that there has to be some kind of deep denial and repression going on collectively about this. Because if you were really facing facts about this, you wouldn't compartmentalize it this way. You wouldn't devote the sorts of resources that are probably being devoted to it, which aren't sufficient. Um, and you certainly wouldn't continue um, keeping a secret for the public. You would you would take precisely the opposite approach. 
So what's the consequences for science? What's the consequences for understanding? Well, the consequences are terrible because you're not engaging in a collective process of discovery, research, uh, debate, deliberation, vetting, all the things you need to do to um, uh, uh, arrive at new ideas and also new truths. So, so to go back to your question, is it over compartmentalization? Is it over classification that's a problem? Yes, but but it's also it's not just the social process, the bureaucratic process. It's a it's a kind of collective psychological. It's, it's we cover up something for ourselves. Gentlemen, the implications of this, and that say we discover something truly profound and truly extraordinary, a non-human intelligence in whatever form that may be. What do we do? Well, first, I look at it this way. How many movies do we see on TV or, or series do we see on TV about a post-apocalyptic world? Humans seem married to this notion of, uh, of something around the corner that's going to be a disaster. Well, I would look at these NHIs or whatever it is that this stuff might represent as hope, right? Or at least as uh, a vision of a possibility that you can get past whatever that inflection point is in society that might lead you to disaster. I mean, maybe the, maybe the road to hope is through disaster. I don't know. But I think the, that, that's the first place that I start. The, the second is the very fact that whatever this is seems willing, at least at a distance, to let itself be seen is some kind of an indication that, uh, I mean, the, 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 people say, well, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Well, why do they need to? Uh, first of all, second, we might be at one level beneath their notice. Third, the, the medium is the message that the fact that they're being seen is a message to individuals to say, well, can you see what's in front of you for what it is? In some ways, it's like the mirror test that we have with animals to determine intelligence. You know, can you see the in the mirror that what you're looking at is yourself? Not that you just need to ignore it because it doesn't bark back at you, but that it is actually you. And so at another level, it's, it's what a scientist would call data off the curve. You know, discoveries are not made by drawing a line and plotting dots along the line and saying, well, look, all the dots fit the line. It's when the point falls off the curve and it doesn't fit the line. That's where discovery is made. That's where the Nobel Prize winners all come from, is looking at the data off the curve. So I think what we're seeing is data off the curve. So in a way, and again, I challenge the skeptics, I call this an intelligence test. Can you see the data for what it is and not dismiss it using previous biases? So I think what we're seeing here from the NHI perspective is you have to ask them the question, okay, well, what is it that is so advanced that might even worry about us? Why would it worry about us? That's a whole set of questions that we could follow up on. The second might be, well, where did it come from? Did it come from another star? From, you know, did it come from some other form of or level of reality that we don't understand. And, and before we, I mean, obviously I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but again, many of your listeners are probably of a religious inclination. Where is heaven and hell? Is that another dimension? So if you're willing to believe in God and other places like heaven and hell, then you already believe in other dimensions. So if there are things that can live in other dimensions, then maybe that's where they come from. I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just speculating wildly. So, and then there's the idea that maybe it's something that has been here all along. It came from perhaps another star long ago. And there was a, a scientist from the 1950s, 60s, von Neumann, who had a, an idea and eventually became known as the von Neumann probe idea. And the notion being that even if you came from a star on the other side of the galaxy, given about a billion years, you could even by conventional means get all the way here simply to, to Earth, not that you knew you wanted to come to Earth, you just make a rock, uh, make an object that goes to another place, makes more copies of yourself, sends out 100 copies of yourself to the next nearby stars, et cetera. And in very short order, in this case, about a billion years, you could be everywhere. And you just, you didn't travel, but your intellectual progeny through, let's say, some kind of AI, artificial intelligence, traveled. Now people say, oh, AI, what could that be? Well, we're using it today. Look at ChatGPT, right? And all of its near cousins 
made by half a dozen. I mean, there's a, there's a trillion dollar industry starting up right in front of us that probably in a, a mat, look at what it's done in only two years. Imagine what it would be in a hundred years. So what we could be seeing is somebody else's chat GPT sent to us via a von Neumann probe approach. So I don't think humans are accustomed to thinking in the kinds of time frames that evolution happens in. All of evolution that created us happened in basically about in less than a billion years. So um, and the universe has been around for about 14 or 15 billion years. About 11 billion of that were capable of producing the kind of life that we know. So you could have hundreds or thousands or millions of civilizations out there, any one of which could have or would have adopted a von Neumann probe approach. I mean, why would they? Well, I'm part of a company put together by Avi Loeb, an astronomer at Harvard called the Copernicus Corporation, people with extremely high level credentials, other professors at Harvard, et cetera, people from NASA, et cetera, all helping. And what are we doing? Well, one thing we're doing is we're going to look for life on Mars. The other thing we're doing is we're going to build the first human von Neumann probe and send it out into the galaxy. So maybe a billion years from now, somebody with 10 tentacles will be having the same conversation, wondering about what it is that's flying around in their skies. And they could have traced it all the way back to us. The scary thing about those kinds of ideas, though, is that, number one, it collapses the Fermi paradox to a single solution, the zoo hypothesis. In other words, if you've got technology like that in your star system, an AI, uh, you know, this is, you are not in control. <laughs> you are not in control, even by virtue of its technology, just, just by virtue of its technology. And... It calls the shots, even if it's totally altruistic or even uninterested in you. Problem is, you can have errors over time. And you can end up with a situation where you got a, a billion-year-old von Neumann probe that isn't quite right in the head anymore. And its original programming, <laughs> its original programming is corrupted. And it's printing out biology and technology and all that with no real purpose anymore other than just doing whatever it thinks it's supposed to do. And those those solutions get terrifying. It sounds like you've got a whole host of science fiction stories you could be writing or a, or a script. Yes. Yeah, well, of course, it's me. It's me. <laughs> That's what I started out as was a science fiction author. But no, I think you're I, I think you're right. But I mean, it's. We always try to apply human level logic and thinking to something which is inherently, and the term non-human, you know, covers it. But the logic is just, it is, is not what, we should not anthropomorphize it. And so that's always the problem. We keep, we keep trying to fit it into our logic structures. And, and again, this is the reason for a place like the Soul Foundation. And it's not as if these ideas haven't been played out in science fiction for decades. I mean, I've, my bread and butter reading as a kid has been, was, was all of that. So it's all been played out before in many different ways and beautiful and fun ways. But now some of those need to be brought to the public at large and to, I think, policymakers uh, at large to say, let's talk about this in a way that allows us to use it or to at least frame a defense against the shock of it i mean it's it's it, it's not that I, I mean look it could probably in the blink of an eye wipe us off the face of the earth drop a rock on us like happened to the dinosaurs and that would be it and it wouldn't take much but it hasn't so at that level i'm not worried about its intent uh, whatever it might be, because it could have. I mean, yes, we are under its under its thumb, let's say, if 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 that's how you want to think about it. But I, I, that doesn't worry me because you know it's not anything that I can affect. And again, I I always try to look for the hopeful opportunity here. So I I look at what we see these vehicles seem to manifest in terms of their capabilities, and I say I want to do that. I want to give other humans the chance to have an opportunity to use that. So how do I structure my arguments to convince other people, not what it is or what its intent might be, but how can I take advantage of it? 
And we do that as scientists all the time. I mean, just look at the biology that we know exists in our bodies and uh, what we know our bodies are capable of. And it's a mechanism that is more complex than any instrument or object that these things might represent. And yet there's extraordinary opportunity just understanding how the human body works for human health or human capabilities. So the same tools that I bring to bear on my science or other scientists bring to bear biology or the natural world is the same kind of thing that I'm just saying, maybe we should spend some time applying to these, whatever these NHIs are. Frankly, I think what we're dealing with is not the original creator of the vehicles. I think it's, you know, I just again speculating. I think it's something made in a way to interact with us. I mean, I've used this example of if you had a race of intelligent ants at the bottom of your garden, how do you interact with it? How do you tell it about TikTok, right? What, what's, what's lost in translation is if you tried to interact with it, probably the best you could do is dangle something that kind of looked like an ant in front of it and dance it around and say, hey, look, there's somebody else here, right? But anything you might try to tell it about what your original intent might be is impossible to convey. So again, the medium is the message. Gary, do you think as a scientist projecting yourself forward in the future with your thinking, does it make some sort of logical sense for, you know, again, we're talking about von Neumann probes and things like that, but it just just sort of seed technology and say, well, look, you've hit splitting the atom. We saw it. And now what we're going to do is seed a little bit of technology so that you learn in the right direction and manage your society better based on what you're finding on what we give you, crashes or whatever, maybe that's it. Does that make sense? As a scientist, might you do it that way? Yes. That's, if you remember back when I was talking about Carl Nell's amendments and the whole, well, it either stays secret or it goes into the public openly, the fight is always going to be not to release stuff, uh, is to have some kind of committee or some, I mean, I, I hate saying the government is the solution because it's, I've learned again and again they're not, have some sort of public-private commission that says, well, here are things that we hope are not dangerous, but that if brought to public understanding and bringing the right scientists in with uh, investment would engage the investment community because they would see the obvious benefit, give them an opportunity to license the intellectual property that might come from it, but then also bring in the right kinds of scientists who in other realms would not be able to get security clearance because of their let's say, behavior, drug use, or what have you, that would then allow them to bring their intellectual merit to the table. So yes, I think seeding that, but do I trust Lockheed to do that? No. I mean, I know how big corporations work. I work with pharma. Thousands of great ideas literally get buried or shut down because somebody decided that the program needs to move in a different direction. Some pencil pusher decided, not a scientist. And so there needs to be a more formalized way to comb through what has been understood about how these vehicles operate, what might be understood, and then saying, okay, here's something that maybe we could bring and to, I'll, I'll, I'll go walk it down, I'll go walk it up and down Sand Hill Road, where all the venture capital is here in the Bay Area, and I'll see who wants to put money down. I bet I would walk out with a pocket full of opportunities. I know we're already doing it. I mean, I've already got, I've already got a, a laundry list of VCs waiting to put money in to this. I mean, they're all excited because VCs, venture community, which has driven the US economy for the last 20 years, they are risk takers and they are willing to put money into something that has opportunity. So I think we have an ignition opportunity here for restarting the U.S. economy in a whole new set of directions. And I'd rather see it happen here in the United States than elsewhere. But I, I, still think, I still think, though, that what happens here can benefit the rest of the planet. As, as well, technology, you know, it, it proliferates and everything, you know, gets uh, it improves overall. Gary, I know you have a heart out and thank you for joining us. And one of these days, I would love to get together with you and just have a conversation about cancer research and the lost opportunities of big pharma. Oh, sure. Happy to do so. Well, thank you guys very much. 
great conversation and I look forward to more as the Soul Foundation's activities continue on and maybe we learn more about whatever this is, but it's certainly worth looking into. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.